Hi everyone, this is Eagle News. I'm Ken Cruz in Washington. It's Saturday, September 17, 2022, here in the nation's capital. The week's recap begins right now. President Joe Biden announces that talks between unions and rail companies have averted a potential strike. Joanne Soriano tells us how this development affects the country's railroad industry. The United States has avoided a potentially disastrous situation. A strike of rail workers threatens not only to disrupt travel, but also to create supply chain issues. This would have put more stress on an already hurting U.S. economy. U.S. President Joe Biden announced that labor unions and rail companies have reached a tentative agreement that averted the strike. The agreement came after a marathon 20 hours of talks that started Wednesday morning and lasted into early Thursday. The resolution came just in time to avoid the Friday deadline that would have seen rail workers walk off the job. Workers complain about staffing shortages and scheduling rules, and ready to work on short notice, sometimes seven days a week. President Biden said rail workers would get better pay, improved working conditions, and peace of mind around their health care costs. The National Railway Labor Conference said the agreement included a 24% wage increase during the five-year period from 2020 through 2024, a 14.1% wage increase effective immediately, and five annual $1,000 lump sum payments. Transportation giant Amtrak canceled long-distance passenger trains in anticipation of the strike. Thursday morning, the company scrambled to restore regular services after the tentative agreement was announced. Joanne Soriano, New York, New York, Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. A shooting rampage in the Greater Toronto area in Canada leaves three dead, including the suspect. Yolanda Espiras reports. Earlier this week, Toronto, Halton and Peel Police Services issued a public safety alert on Monday due to an active shooter. The shooting began at a coffee shop in Mississauga and ended at an auto body shop in Milton. Two people died and few were injured. One of the victims was 48-year-old Toronto Police Officer Constable Andrew Hong. The 22-year veteran was attending a joint police training exercise in Mississauga and was shot while on lunch break at Tim Hortons. Constable Hong died at the scene. He was married and a father of two. The shooting rampage continued into Milton with three people shot inside an auto shop. The second victim, 30-year-old local mechanic Shaquille Ruff, was pronounced dead on scene, with two others rushed to the hospital with critical injuries. Ruff was a father of two. The suspect was ultimately located in Hamilton and was shot and killed by police. As of Wednesday, the motivation for the shootings is still unknown and the gunman is still unidentified. The clock tower in Mississauga was deep, the CN Tower was lit blue, and flags were at half-mast Tuesday night in remembrance of Constable Andrew Hong and Shaquille Asraf. Yolanda Aspiras, Toronto, Ontario. Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. The suspect who died after a confrontation with police has been identified as 40-year-old Sean Petrie. In two weeks, 1.7 million students in Pennsylvania will begin having access to free breakfast for the rest of the school year. Myla Simbolan tells us more. Free breakfast will be served in Pennsylvania schools for its 1.7 million students this year. Uh, It's unacceptable for any student anywhere to be hungry. And we all know how important education is to our communities We now know how important nutrition is to education. We want high quality education in Pennsylvania. We gotta make sure that everybody who comes to school can can eat, gets fed. And that's why we have increased education funding generally over the past eight years. Uh, But it's why we're doing this program to make sure. It is called the Universal Free Breakfast Program. It will begin October 1st and run through the end of the school year. 
Over 1.7 million Pennsylvania children enrolled in public schools, intermediate units, charter schools, career and technology schools, and child care institutions that participate in the national school lunch and school breakfast programs will benefit from the state-funded program. The $21.5 million program is funded with prior year funding from the School Food Services General Fund Appropriation. It continues the pandemic program that provided free meals through the Department of Agriculture until the end of last school year. According to statistics, breakfast consumption in Pennsylvania schools increased by 16% during the time when it was provided for free. The Universal Free Breakfast Program addresses a key element in the national fight to address food insecurity and inflation. Milo Simbulan, Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, Eagle News, we live in extraordinary times. There's additional money for road work in Nevada. With over $100 million in federal funds, the state looks at more constructions and repairs on its streets. Anna Kui tells us more. Construction zones are all over the Las Vegas Valley and sometimes it is frustrating to be stuck in traffic because of them. But they're actually more than just a nuisance. It is a sign that the Nevada Department of Transportation continues to work hard to make sure that numerous transportation projects are ready to fully take advantage of authorized annual federal transportation funds. NDOT recently announced that $101 million in additional federal highway spending authority has been made available for road and bridge projects in the state as part of the August redistribution from the Federal Highway Administration or FHWA. Each year in August, FHWA looks at the spending authorization for every state and redistributes funds from those states and able to use the full amount originally authorized to them. In addition, they also reviewed federal transportation grant and loan programs that were underutilized during the year. And then they take all these redistributed funds and send them to states who have current projects that meet funding requirements. According to NDOT, the additional $101 million spending authority will allow the state to receive federal reimbursement more quickly so that they can continue to plan and advance projects. It's also worth noting that it is the largest August redistribution increase Nevada has ever received. But according to the agency, despite the significant amount, the state highway fund faces an annual deficit of more than $530 million and it only continues to grow. NDOT, in partnership with other local government agencies, has a long list of transportation projects, some now in progress and while others are projected to start in the next five years. Anna Kui, Las Vegas, Nevada, Eagle News, we live in extraordinary times. It's time for Correspondent at Large. This week, Thomas Likeness tells us about the White House's reaction to what it calls a political stunt pulled by Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida and Greg Abbott of Texas. Plus, how lakes and rivers in Central America are drying up because of plastic pollution. And humans versus birds in Australia. Oh, and burgers made of bugs? Intriguing. Take a look. And now news and commentary from around the globe. A human tragedy. The people you see here on the screen have traveled all the way from Venezuela in South America, up through Central America, northward through Mexico, to the United States, to escape oppression, to seek a better life. They have crossed over the Mexican-US border, all undocumented, seeking asylum. Undocumented migrants have become a major issue in the United States. It's being talked about in campaign speeches leading up to November's midterm elections. A couple of Republican governors, Ron DeSantis in Florida, Greg Abbott in Texas, well, they got the bright idea to round up a bunch of migrants and relocate them to posh, Democrat-led areas. You know, just drop them off and leave them to fend for themselves in hopes of annoying the residents of these Tony areas. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre called out DeSantis and Abbott for political grandstanding. The fact that, the, that Fox News and not the Department of Homeland Security 
the city or local NGOs were alerted about a plan to leave migrants, including children on the side of a busy DC street, makes clear that this is just a cruel, premeditated political stunt. This is what they are doing. What happened to those words written in a sonnet on a plaque at the base of the Statue of Liberty? Remember, give us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses. Perhaps when voters go to the polls in six weeks' time, they will show these guys the same compassion they have shown the migrants. This is Lake Suchitan in El Salvador. Oh, wait a minute, isn't there supposed to be water in this lake? There is, but it's under all of this plastic. Where did it all come from? People throw their garbage into the rivers which feed this lake and it finally all accumulates here. It's not only in this lake and rivers in El Salvador that plastic pollution is a problem, but all over Central America. In El Salvador alone, it's estimated people generate 4,200 tons of waste every day. And just over a quarter of that ends up in rivers, on beaches, or on the country's streets. And that's how you end up with a situation like this in Lake Suchitlan. People try to clean it up, but just as quickly as the trash is gone, more reappears. Plastic pollution is widespread, well beyond what I have shown you. It's a global problem. What's it like in your neighborhood? It's war in Australia, humans versus an avian enemy. The battleground is the picturesque town of Stanwall Park. It's near Sydney. The fight over garbage. The enemy, the sulfur-crusted cockatoo. The birds are sparring with people over trash. Seems the feathered fiends like to scarf down the scraps. Putting it in bins isn't much of a deterrent. The birds have figured out how to open them. Here you can see them hanging around a local cafe. Waiter Caitlin Gilbert says the birds are a nuisance. Loud. They probably yell at you a lot. Especially early in the morning. <laughs> Uh, very persistent. Gilbert says the birds get aggressive if you try to scare them off. I once tried to shoo one away in front of a supermarket and it like was arcing up to me. <laughs> well, despite the annoyance, some people have a soft spot for them. It's not too bad actually. Um, as you can see, they, they keep us company. Um, yeah, but they, they seem to be pretty chill, you know? Yeah, they are kind of nice to watch. Well, the birds might like this stack, but for me, I think it's going to be an acquired taste. Cricket burgers. A pop-up eatery in Thailand is serving fusion bug burgers. Bounce Burger Restaurant in Bangkok not only makes burgers, but sausages and baked goods, all with the insects mixed into the ingredients. The insects are sourced locally from cricket farms. Proponents say eating insects has less of an environmental footprint than, say, consuming chicken, beef, or pork. Thailand has thousands of cricket farms. Until recently, most of them catered to supplying animal feed. Now, they're focusing on edible insects for people. You know, I'm a pretty adventurous diner, but I think it's going to be a while before I consider ordering a McCricket. Back in seven days, in the meantime, I wish you all peace, joy, and happiness in the ensuing week. Thomas I. Likeness, correspondent at large, Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. Malaysia Day in Papua New Guinea brings together leaders of the two countries in celebration of culture and tradition, and a hope for a future of success in economics, technology, and industries development. Echo Hortaleza Quinola on this week's Oceania at a Glance. Malaysia and Papua New Guinea have established diplomatic relations since 1975 and have been expanding in many different areas and varying levels. Papua New Guinea's Minister of Tourism, Culture and Arts, Honorable E.C. Henry Leonard, 
welcomes Malaysia's Minister for Tourism and Creative Industry, His Excellency Dato Sir Haji Abdul Karim Rahman Hamza. The Malaysian representative is on his two-day state visit to engage with the Malaysian community for the celebration of Malaysia Day. First of all, I'm deeply touched by the reception made by the Minister of Tourism and Culture upon you receiving this. This is my first trip to Papua New Different from what we have, and true enough, as I know, as Honorable Your Excellency, PC Henry was mentioning just now, unity and diversity. We are also using that as the way for us to bring ourselves together. The two countries have agreed to exchange cultural and traditional knowledge and practices, including arts and crafts. The program ends with the crowning of necklace and billums and a hand-painted gift portrait of Dato Sri Haji. Echo Hortaleza Quinola, Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea, Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. For this year's World Patient Safety Day, the World Health Organization calls on healthcare workers, caregivers, and patients to take a proactive approach to prevent and reduce medication related harm. Their call to action know the patient and the medication, check the particulars, ask to make sure everything is right. Arlene Ocampo reports on this week's Health is Wealth. September 17 is World Patient Safety Day. Communities, health workers, and leaders, policymakers come together to strengthen their commitment to patient safety. This year, the World Health Organization launches a campaign. The theme, medication safety. It is in support of the agency's already existing WHO Global Patient Safety Challenge, Medication Without Harm. The campaign aims to raise awareness on medication-related harm due to medication errors and unsafe practices. Advocate urgent action to improve medication safety. Engage key people to prevent and reduce medication-related harm. And empower everyone to be involved in the safe use of medication. According to WHO, medication harm accounts for 50% of the overall preventable harm in medical care. The agency notes that 42 billion US dollars of global total health expenditure worldwide can be avoided if medication errors are prevented. To observe World Patient Safety Day 2022, the WHO organizes a series of webinars on medication safety and hosts a global virtual event. Arlene Ocampo, Fort Washington, Maryland, Eagle News, we live in extraordinary times. Five out of 10 healthcare facilities around the world do not meet the standards set by WHO and UNICEF of basic hygiene services, putting billions of people at risk. Jeff Sanadad has the details. According to a joint report by the World Health Organization and UNICEF, half of healthcare facilities around the world lack basic hygiene services. That means with water and soap or alcohol-based hand rubs where patients receive care and the toilets in these facilities. The report says around 3.8 billion people use these facilities. And the lack of basic hygiene services puts them at a greater risk of infection. This includes 688 million people who receive care at facilities with no hygiene services at all. World Health Organization says hygiene facilities and practices in healthcare settings are non-negotiable. Their improvement is essential to pandemic recovery, prevention, and preparedness. The agency says hygiene in healthcare facilities cannot be secured without increasing investments in basic measures, which includes safe water, clean toilets, and safely managed healthcare waste. The report reveals that although 68% of healthcare facilities had hygiene facilities at points of care, and 65% had hand washing facilities with water and soap at toilets, only 51% had both and therefore met the criteria for basic hygiene services. One in 11 or 9% of healthcare facilities globally have neither. 
UNICEF says hospitals and clinics without safe water and basic hygiene and sanitation services are a potential death trap for pregnant mothers, newborns, and children. Every year, around 670,000 newborns lose their lives to sepsis, a travesty UNICEF says even more so as these deaths are preventable. The report also notes that contaminated hands and environment plays a significant role in pathogen transmission in healthcare facilities and the spread of antimicrobial resistance. Jeff Sanidad, Washington, D.C., Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. Hundreds of thousands of people in the United States develop sepsis, the body's extreme and often deadly response to infection. What does the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention want the public to know to get ahead of this life-threatening medical emergency? Rosal Feria reports. Did you know that each year about 1.7 million adults in America develop sepsis? And that 350,000 of these adults die during hospitalization or are discharged to hospice? September is Sepsis Awareness Month and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or CDC is educating the public on how to get ahead of this life-threatening medical emergency. The CDC says sepsis is the body's extreme response to an infection. It happens when an infection you already have triggers a chain reaction throughout your body. Infections that lead to sepsis most often start in the lungs, urinary tract, skin, or gastrointestinal tract. And if not treated immediately, sepsis can rapidly lead to tissue damage, organ failure, and death. People who are at higher risk for sepsis include adults 65 or older, people with weakened immune systems, people with chronic medical conditions, people with recent severe illnesses or hospitalization, including due to severe COVID-19, people who survived sepsis, and or children younger than one. Signs or symptoms include high heart rate or weak pulse, fever, shivering or feeling very cold, confusion or disorientation, shortness of breath, extreme pain or discomfort, clammy or sweaty skin. The CDC advises that sepsis is a medical emergency. If you or your loved one has an infection that's not getting better or is getting worse, act fast, get medical care immediately, Ask your healthcare professional if your infection could lead to sepsis and if you should go to the emergency room. For more information on how to get ahead of sepsis, visit cdc.gov. Rosel Feria, Washington, D.C., Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. In related news, researchers and developers are looking at artificial intelligence as a way for detecting life-threatening health issues such as sepsis. With more details, here's David Oria. A topic of discussion for the past few years has been centered around the role of artificial intelligence or AI in healthcare. For example, Oshner Health in Louisiana built an AI model detecting early signs of sepsis, a life-threatening response to an infection. During the pandemic, AI development accelerated in the medical field due to shared data on COVID-19 and anonymized patient data to investigate treatments. Companies such as Microsoft and Adaptive Biotechnologies have even put their technology to work on patient data to see how the virus affected the immune system. However, advancement in technology also comes with its own set of barriers. With the speed of technological advancements, regulating algorithms will be a challenge. Even with the FDA's published guidelines, the biggest hurdle is the system. Health systems need to allow algorithms to access patient data. Unfortunately, healthcare comes with strong privacy protections that limit the amount and type of data companies can collect. As a result, there's a lack of strong data on health outcomes, making it more difficult for providers to use AI to improve how to treat patients. But even if that does come, healthcare experts warn the use of AI and algorithms could eventually worsen bias and health disparities. David Oria, Health is Wealth, Eagle News. A new study suggests a lifetime of physical fitness could begin in childhood. The study says doing something as simple as walking or biking to school may train an individual to develop long-term health habits. Details from Mylin Dineros. Researchers found if children actively commuted to school instead of riding in a car or a bus, they are more likely to continue being active in future years. And if this activity continues into adulthood, they could reap the health benefits of this simple exercise. 
exercise becomes a habit for them. Sadly, most kids don't get the minimum of 60 minutes of daily activity recommended by health experts. Walking or biking to school could contribute to that activity. Just over 1 in 10 children actively commute to school. That's a figure that hasn't changed in the last decade. Demographics play a role as well. The study found that children of immigrants are also less likely to walk to school. Some states, like California, are taking steps to improve the walkability of neighborhoods. They are adding more sidewalks and trees for a more pleasant commute. Despite those measures, many parents are still reluctant to let their children walk to school for safety reasons, via traffic or unsafe conditions in the neighborhood. For those concerned about letting their youngsters walk to school alone, experts recommend their parents to accompany their children. They say that mom and dad could use the opportunity to teach their kids traffic safety and the locations of trusted neighbors and friends. And while they are doing this, they are helping their children develop a habit that will lead to better health in adulthood. The researchers' findings have been published in the journal Preventive Medicine Reports, Maylin Danero's Corpus, Los Angeles, California, Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. Arlene Ocampo tells us about a Latin American film showing soon in the country that tells the struggles and triumphs experienced by undocumented children and families here in the United States. Here's this week's Embassy Files. As part of hashtag Cinemexa, the film program of the Mexican Cultural Institute here in Washington, D.C. presents the U.S. premiere of Home is Somewhere Else. The showing is part of the AFI Latin Film Festival to be shown at the AFI Silver Theater and Cultural Center on September 26. The animated documentary tells three personal stories, each narrated by a real-life protagonist. Two teenage sisters who both have different immigration statuses make sure this does not spoil their relationship. A young girl, always afraid her parents would be deported, has led her to what she is now. And a poet who binds these three stories together with his thoughts, narrates his childhood, when he got deported from the U.S. as a young man, and his journey thereafter. These three stories manifest the complicated emotional experiences of undocumented children and families here in the United States. Their distresses, aspirations, and struggles for a tomorrow better than their today. Arlene Ocampo, Embassy Files, Eagle News, we live in extraordinary times. Another tennis legend is set to retire. This time, it's Swiss star Roger Federer. With the details, here's our correspondent E.J. Gonzalez on EBC Sports International. Swiss tennis superstar Roger Federer took to social media to announce his retirement from professional tennis, a career that stretched more than 24 years. On Thursday morning, he posted on his Twitter account telling fans that the Levere Cup in London will be his final ATP event. The 41-year-old has played more than 1,500 matches and has won 20 Grand Slam titles. Recently though, injuries have kept him off of the court. He underwent his third surgery in just 18 months. His last tournament was in 2021, where he lost in the quarterfinals at Wimbledon. Federer said he has worked hard to return to full competitive form, but knows his body's capacities and limits. At the end of his tweet, Federer assured his fans his feeling for the sport would not fade, saying, finally, to the game of tennis, I love you and will never leave you. E.J. Gonzalez, Alexandria, Virginia, Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. Before we let you go, here's an amazing photo of the National Mall taken from the top of the Washington Monument, the 555 feet tall obelisk towering over the nation's most visited memorials. Thank you, Eagle News friend Jay Figueroa, 
for this beautiful, beautiful shot. And thank you all for joining us again. Comment below for stories or topics you want us to share with you. View, like, share our online shows. City Limits with Alan Basalyahe, connected with Dr. David. Take a seat and join us with Anna Kui. Plate Date with Mike Hudson and Friends. Plus, Journey Stories of Filipinos in Canada with Kathleen. Always gonna say this because it is truly the best last name, Cruz. Follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter at Eagle News Live. I'm Ken Cruz. We live in extraordinary times. Happy weekend, everyone.